Okay, so um, good morning, everybody. And I'm very pleased to be here. I've truly enjoyed the past two days because uh, I was so attentive that I didn't even have time to check my email in between. <laughs> so I hope it goes on like that. And um, I would like to talk about um, quantum optical demonstration, which is at the heart of my experimental life or so to quantum technology. So let me begin with um, an article that appeared in a German weekly magazine recently. Uh, I have to translate it to you. So this is obviously from the old ENIAC uh, uh, machine in uh, Harvard or so. And so it says, the competition for the quantum computer. And it says, humanity is facing one of the biggest breakthroughs in technology, in the history of technology. Whoever builds the first quantum computer, he will get a computer which is 100 million times faster uh, than everything else uh, so far. And on the home stretch, there are NASA, Google, IBM, <laughs> and a few engineers from Germany. Um, no physicists or so, <laughs> which is kind of funny. And I must say, this is a bit detrimental for science. So I, I really didn't enjoy the statements of some of my colleagues in this article. And uh, it's not even wrong, on the other hand, <laughs> or so. Um, so what is a quantum computer supposed to do? It's supposed to do factorization, and this is not so bad or so. And if I'm not a mathematician, I can just quote what they say. So the scaling laws and classical factorization go exponentially, and this is what we want to beat or so. And uh, so quantum would only scale logarithmically with the length of the bit string or so. And then if you do it for a number of bits, for, for the number of digits or so, then you would find that classically, actually at 550 digits, you are much ahead classically and uh, only if you go for something like 2,000 bits or so, you will really beat the classical world. So I think this is fairly far down the stream to really go to this regime or so, yeah? Uh, 100 million times faster, but it's not even wrong, perhaps. Okay, so <laughs> this is the toolbox that we use to um, do experiments. It's basically um, with cold atoms. Our cold atoms are stored in an optical lattice. I'm not going to talk about any details. The specialty that we have is our lattice is very deep, and it's in fact, uh, from my point of view, it's more like iron trapping than the typical uh, cold atom community because uh, tunneling between the two lattices or between two adjacent sides is completely suppressed because our lattice is so deep. For our realistic condition, there is no tunneling. Our tunneling is, but tunneling is completely replaced in our case by us flipping the spin with microwaves and then shifting the atoms uh, in a discrete way around. So this is shown here. We have two atoms we can uh, throw a few out of, few, few uh, of them, ah, we, we can throw some out, work with these to bring them to different positions. Our experiment is done and then we have to do it over or go for the ensembles, for instance, and so on. And uh, the other experiment uh, tool that we have is we can insert these atoms into a cavity and so we can use the nonlinearities at the single atom, single photon level to do experiments. And the scale is here 10 microns. This is our old apparatus, which is now 12 years old. You will see pictures of our new apparatus, which is uh, uh, opening a new world for us. So this is what I want to talk about. The first thing is about uh, quantum walks. Quantum walks, in the end, is splitting the trajectories of atoms, and even the two-slit experiment also, which you will see. And uh, then I will uh, talk about, it's like a remake of a movie, an atomic bomb test, it's the Elitzur Weidmann um, experiment, which is 30 years old, and we made a remake, like uh, Gone by the Wind or so again. <laughs> and uh, so then I will talk about a new idea, which is today coming onto the archive, actually, of exchanging two identical particles, how to scale up. And then we will go on a little more towards uh, quantum technology, perhaps. So let me briefly introduce what I mean by quantum walks. Quantum walks, we have um, two operations available. This is the Bloch sphere, and uh, so we have spin down and spin up, and uh, we use microwaves to do rotations. And I think we have heard this now on and off with X, Y, Z um, operations and so on. <laughs> uh, we have a little language for ourselves where we represent this in terms of Lego blocks in order to do this. Uh, so this is our rotation on the spin one-half system. Every atom has a spin, is an effective pseudo-spin one-half system. And we have, on the other hand, our lattice. And in our lattice, because it's so deep and because we can do the transport and the trajectories, it's really quantum number. So the number of the side that we have is really a quantum number. And so we have a combined operation of a rotation and a shift. And so if you um, do a shift to the equatorial plane, you split the atom trajectory. Yeah? So part of the atom will the spin up, part may move, move left, and uh, the spin up part may move right or vice versa. And you can do this multiple times. And this is what a quantum walk is about. 
And uh, since, in the end, I don't want to really talk too much about big quantum uh, walk experiments, um, I would like to uh, uh, only show you one experiment. Yeah, this is the way we do it. So the system is discrete in space and time. It's discrete because it's a lattice, and we run uh, one operation at a time. And we can do it multiple times. And so that's why you can stack this. And uh, you can have, uh, well, shifts, pi pulses rotated around. You can, one interesting thing is that in, in, in contrast, for instance, to uh, most photon experiments, which of course have some similarity, we can wait. We can just wait and have the atom sit to accumulate phases, to de-phase de, uh, or do other things or so. And splitting, of course, always means delocalizing the atom in space over many quantum sites. And so um, this is just the final result already, which I'm uh, showing you here. Um, so um, if we operate this um, system many times and this procedure split, move, split, move, split, move, and so on, then the atom gets delocalized. And uh, at the present time, we can approximately localize an atom over, let's say, 50 or 60 sites in a coherent way. And we can uh, uh, refocus everything, and then it comes back to um, the initial site. We can measure the decoherence properties and so on. This is the fairly well-known ballistic sp spreading um, of the uh, quantum walk in contrast to the diffusive spreading if you would just, just have a classical coin where you uh, toss it and then you just decide you go left and right. Our systems always go left and right and there's multiple path interference and the multiple path interference leads to the ballistic linear expansion and of course after some time uh, decoherence creeps in and right now we can do something like 52 uh, or, or on the order of 50 steps in a uh, coherent way in, this, uh, in the system. So, um, now let's go back to the simplest possible case, uh, which is a uh, Marcinder interferometer. Yeah? So what we do is we just take a single atom and uh, we put it into a single site and we split it. Means we have initially a, a single um, spin prepared, we put it into the equatorial plane, a superposition of up and down, and then of course we can uh, have the atom walk and we can turn the spins around so then they move into the opposite direction. This is something we actually call proto-entanglement which is very, I think proto-entanglement, although in the end it's not useful on a, at the single particle level, but if you look into uh, many other experiments, I think creating single particle entanglement first and then mapping it on two, to, uh, two particles is almost something like a recipe uh, to create entanglement or so. And so I think that's the uh, blueprint for us also in the future to go. And then we can have it come back, and then of course um, we need to apply an, a final um, a pulse here, which is the second splitting pulse, and then all we have done is the equivalent of an uh, optical Mazinter interferometer. Yeah? And uh, so um, we can also take pictures of that. So here's uh, pictures, and we have used two different false colors to make sure that this is not one and the same experiment where we see the atom simultaneously in two positions. Of course, it's different realizations of the experiment. And uh, this is, uh, so it's visualizing a split atom trajectory and the quantum projection postulate onto these uh, different uh, sites. And this is about uh, five, six, seven years now. Or at that time, we had something like 20 micrometer separation in this interferometer. I think the definition of usual interferometer is that if you have a two-path interferometer, you need to be able to put something in between. And this is almost and, and reasonably fulfilled here already. Uh, we are now going to about 200 micrometer and we think that with our apparatus, we should even be able to split a single particle uh, across a separation of uh, one millimeter, which brings us into the region where we could start to test quantum mechanics at longer scales and superposition principles at longer scales with uh, massive particles. Okay, um, of course, the interferometer uh, needs to show a fringe, and this is the fringe. And if you go back here, then um, the fringe is the final splitting here, and the um, the, what you do in, a, in an experiment in Marcinda, you shift this uh, bit of si slightly around to control the phase. In our case, we have to control the phase of the microwave operation. And as a function of this microwave phase, we see very nice fringes. This proves that really these are quantum uh, systems, and our uh, sites are also indeed quantum objects and quantum numbers that we can associate with that. And it, of course, it, it, it comes out of a, an ensemble, as you saw, uh, with the uh, uh, noisy and then the more uh, particles you take, the better it gets. Okay, now my, yes? Just a quick question, I mean, where is the other port? I mean, if it's constructive interference... Oh, where is the other port? Yes, the, the two ports are the two spin states. Okay. Yeah, and I get, if I just select one spin state, I get this one, and I get the complementary signal for the other spin state. Okay? 
uh, there, there's many subtleties to that, but that's the simplest answer. Okay, let's go on to the atomic bomb test, which uh, was invented, I think, here in Israel. Yes, please. Oh yes, oh yes, in co oh yes. Um, we are all, we are working uh, with the extreme F states because we want to have good magnetic coupling, and uh, we keep improving our magnetic shielding. Yes, we do. Um, oh, uh, 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 well, we have a long list of decoherence measures, and the ambient field fluctuations are still the biggest one of them. And we now have a new uh, apparatus which has a two or three-fold, a two-fold magnetic layer, which should suppress all magnetic field fluctuations by a factor of 500 or so. So we believe that then we are limited by other uh, factors. Right now, we are limited to uh, decoherence times at the level of one millisecond in the best case. Okay. All right, so now let's go to this uh, atomic bomb test, which I said was uh, invented here 30 years ago in the uh, late 80s uh, or so, or early 80s. And uh, it's made dramatic, as you will see in just a moment. And what I would like to associate it with is the uh, a notion that was uh, introduced by Tony Leggett uh, on ideal negative uh, measurements. And I think we have a very nice implementation of uh, this ideal negative measurement. And on top of the remake, this is the new aspect of what we do here. And it's this, what is also called interaction-free me uh, measurement. So uh, not going into details or into subtleties as were presented in the previous talk, um, I just take a very simple stand that is that the quantum physicist think thinks that uh, projection always alters the dynamics of your system even if you don't see the system uh, because you do a projection to another a part of the Hilbert space or so, whereas the macro-realist says there is no atom, I haven't seen anything, there is no change in my dynamics. And Leggett Gark uh, gave a criterion, which I'm not going to in any teaser, I'm going to show it, but uh, nothing more, which gives an inequality which distinguishes these two, um, uh, two ideas in a quantitative way. Uh, so this is uh, by Andrea Alberti, just a, a, a visualization of this. So if you have a two-state system and uh, the mouse is prepared in an unknown state, then if you look, um, then if you don't find the mouse, no change in the classical world, and, uh, but if you uh, find the mouse or so, then there should be a change in the classical world here or so. Okay, so this is now the elito weidmann experiment, which you probably know from your uh, lectures or so. So what is the idea? This is a bomb, and the bomb has a trigger, which is this photodiode here, and this trigger may be bad or so, may be uh, broken or so. And you would like to find, you would like to distinguish with an experiment uh, the bad bombs from the active bombs or so. And of course, this trigger works uh, at the level of a single photon. So if you shine a single photon on there, it's going to, be, to explode. And you want to avoid this. And the idea, this is two situations. So here the bomb is uh, inactive. And so if you um, have this inactive uh, bomb sitting in one arm of the smart cinder interferometer, um, you can adjust your beam splitter in such a way that the phase acts in such a way that all the uh, output is directed to this detector D2. Yeah? Okay, so that's what we have in this case. And uh, then we also have active bombs, and we want to now found, find out active bombs. And if the active bomb is here, then this um, arm, this branch is simply interrupted. And then what happens is that at least in a quarter of the cases, you get a signal here, because there is no interference anymore in this branch. And so if you get a signal here, then you can say, okay, I have found an active bomb. I can take it out and use it for something, fireworks or whatever or so. You may say, okay, a quarter is not so impressive, uh, but there are more advanced versions of this ex experiment where you can come as close as you like to one or so. And I think the, in the end, is the conceptual way. And so in a way, this photon, so this, in, in this way of speaking, this photon has never really seen this um, uh, uh, bomb or this trigger here, and you still have obtained the information. Okay, so that's the... A version that we use our atom interferometer now for. And uh, so the criterion uh, which we worked out together with um, uh, Clive Emery uh, is shown here. So these cues are simply measurements and you just work on um, correlations of these measurements. And you see there are three times, so we have to do three measurements at three times. And uh, then we just have this uh, correlation, total correlation function. Yeah? And um, you can, you're free to assign the values uh, in any way. What you want to do is you want to maximize your k value in contrast to one. And so one way to do is to just give ones or so uh, to this. And this is what we did also in our case. So what's going to happen? This is, uh, this is the experiment that we do. 
So if you go on the left side, then this is basically what you have just seen with the single uh, atom interferometer. So we take an atom. This is already the Q1 measurement. The preparation is the Q1. And then we apply the uh, pi or two pipes. We split the trajectories. And then if we go here, then after some time, we apply the second pulse, exactly what we did in this interferometer. We don't even have to bring them apart and back together. We can just go on like this. And then in the end, we have to detect the spin state. This is what the fringe was. And so then in the end, we find whether it's in detector D2 or in detector D1. And uh, for the non-measurement, you expect to have a quarter or so again in this D2. And uh, as we uh, depend, or, or everything in D2, um, depending on the setting of your experiment. Now, if we, on the other hand, say there is an active trigger or so, um, then what we can do is, oops, oops, sorry, I passed it wrong. If we have an active trigger, then we can simulate this by very far removing uh, one spin state from the uh, system. Yeah? This amounts to this looking whether the atom is there. And now you can think of it, if it's not there, then um, I have e perfectly implemented this ideal negative measurement, and then I go on. But because I have only one spin component left, now the pi, pi over two pi is doing something very different, and I get other signals here. Yeah? And so if I get the signal now here, I have implemented exactly the same test um, as before. And so here is the typical signals. Then for these uh, different conditions, this is what we find. It's what you expect. Yeah? And uh, then we can construct the correlator from this. And you see that it very strongly violates at the level of many sigmas, which in this case is only a question of doing more experiments or so, um, or close to the theoretically uh, supposed level at uh, 2 or so. And there's one thing uh, we can also do here already different from uh, the photon experiment is so, so the number one is we show here that this uh, um, non -neg this um, uh, ideal negative measurement is equivalent to the non-interacting uh, idea of the measurement, and um, that we can indeed transform it this into a test of the legged gag inequality. And then when we simply wait, when we let the coherence creep in, then we go back. Uh, in our measurements in the results to the classical region. Okay, so I chose that we can really test at this level the superposition principle here in a quantitative way. Okay, so um, that was one application of the uh, atom interferometer. Now let's go to this question of uh, exchanging two identical particles. And uh, so um, if you ask uh, theories, theorists in their theory lecture on uh, fermions what they are, then they say they take one e electron here, another one here, and if you exchange them, they have to uh, exchange a sign. They have to flip the sign of the wave function and so on. And um, so then if you look around, then um, there are sayings like one electron in Tel Aviv and another one in Berlin have a joint symmetrized wave function already. Actually, in my favorite uh, one of my favorite quantum mechanics books by Sakurai, he says, this is rubbish. Uh, you don't have to think about it. There's no need to think about it in these terms. And on the other hand, um, I think as an experimentalist, I personally like an operational approach and view of what's going on. And so preparing one electron in Tel Aviv and another one in Berlin, for me, certainly readers, renders these particles uh, at least initially uh, completely uh, distinguishable. Yeah, I don't have any problem in my mind with that. So this is the situation we want to test. So for bosons, you would expect that if we look, go for this quantum inference, that interference at the two-particle wave function would be unchanged. For fermions, would change the sign. The question that we were asking us ourselves for, we have discussed about this for two or three years, and today, actually, finally, our manuscript is uh, going onto the archive or so, uh, can we illustrate this concept experimentally? And uh, we, we came up with this concept here. So we prepare two atoms initially, and what we do uh, is not a single particle interferometer, as you have seen it before, but we do a two-particle, uh, two-path interferometer. So we have a reference wave of these two particles. We have an adjustable phase shift. We can, again, uh, adjust the phase shift by waiting. We can apply magnetic fields to uh, assign different um, uh, phases to the two uh, spins that our particles have. And then in the active arm or branch of the uh, interferometer, what we do is we exchange the two uh, particles. Yeah? We actively exchange the two particles in our system, and then we recombine them simultaneously. Yeah? And so the nice thing, what we like about this is that these two particles have never seen each other, and we're still testing their um, quantum uh, interference at, only at the end. Yeah? So you may say, OK, this sounds uh, similar to the Hong U Mandel or uh, the um, the Hanbury-Brown twist experiments, and yes, indeed, there is a, a great similarity. 
And I think the difference between this experiment and this experiment is that in, this ex in these experiments, this is um, Henbury Brown, where you have two sources and the two detectors cannot really distinguish them because they have uh, an opening angle. So they are within the same uh, uh, cone of the light, not cone, within the same uh, opening angle of the light field and so on. And this is, by the way, the interpretation by Ugo Fano for the, um, for the Henry Brown twist experiment. And you see that we have an overlap of the two particles here. And again, Hongo Mantel uh, means that we interfere two sources on a beam splitter, and then we have either two particles going out here or two particles going out there. And again, we have a strong overlap. And so we look for two particles event here. Here, we post select. There's also a probability just by uh, counting the number of possibilities or so. There's a possibility to have two particles here or two particles there, which you can also work on. In our case, we are going to only post select when we have one particle here, another one here, which makes a, a difference already to the system. And so, indeed, this should be uh, uh, possible um, to illustrate this. And so we will see, by uh, performing a parity measurement, we should see um, an interferometer fringe for this two-particle, two-path interferometer uh, experiment. And I think both of these, both of these um, statements are actually correct in the end. Um, because what happens is really that the experiments erase, erase which path information. Yeah? So if you see here, if this path goes here, and at the same time this path goes here. But by nature of the experiment, we cannot distinguish whether this particle came from this source and this source, or this particle came from any of the two sources. And this is very similar to the uh, two other experiments here. OK. Um, just a brief glance of how the implementations could look like. This is for the neutral epsilon experiments, which um, uh, we will uh, hopefully within the next two years perform in our case. So we have two atoms, which uh, a left one and a right one, and we have them in their spin states. And then we can use our uh, spin-dependent transport devices to, uh, to transport them around, and um, then eventually to uh, combine left atom trajectory with the right atom trajectory, and here the same thing. The nice thing about this, we have uh, calculated uh, all the procedures we need for this already, is there's a lot of common mode rejection, which makes this experiment very likely, or very that we have good hope that this experiment is uh, going to work in this case. And it's actually going to create entanglement. So even though these particles are initially not entangled, in the end, they will be entangled. By the way, on the parity measurement, you may ask, how is this possible? But if you look at these two spins, this is, of course, uh, one component of a triplet state. And if you start rotating this um, uh, triplet uh, system, then you will see uh, uh, different uh, numbers for the parity measurement in this case. And I must say, to my surprise, it, was, it came out of a talk I gave at Berkeley three or two or three years ago. And uh, when, when uh, Hartmut Hefner said to me, we've been thinking about something similar with ions. And I was surprised that you could do something with ions. Uh, there's nothing, there's, fundamentally, there's nothing wrong to do this with ions. But I had always thought that with ions, it would be too difficult to really delocalize a single ion or so. Um, but uh, in a very clever way, they have come up with the idea to use a ring trap. Yeah, so to use the ring trap with two ions, and then again split these two ions, and then bring the two half trajectories to each other. So this is what we do here. So you split each of these ions. This can be prepared, and then you just turn them around on the ring, and then you can do a similar experiment that we do on a line on a ring. And uh, since then, the forces on the ions should be controlled in a way that you can do it. So we believe that both of our, of our groups should implement uh, this experiment once with ions and uh, in our case with atoms. Okay, scaling up quantum walks, where can we go? What can we do in the future? Um, one thing, um, the experiments I showed you initially, um, or our old experiment, was working in the following way. Um, we have these two waves. Yeah? We are coupling with a sigma plus wave to the spin up and with sigma minus wave to the spin down wave. And in order to steer these uh, sigma uh, two uh, opposing sigma waves, what we had to do, we had to use electro-optic modulators to, uh, uh, to turn this around. And the dynamic range of electro-optic modulators, everybody in the lab knows that um, it's limited to essentially 2 pi. You, and this means we could go only one side. We could go to the neighboring side. Now, our new device allows us to go with extremely high precision um, across 100 sites in a very short time. So we can arbitrary, we can uh, make arbitrarily uh, atoms meet each other, and uh, the, this looks complicated. And uh, 
uh, the essential point, and this is an optical phase lock loops. We are used to, I think, since the many years, we are now used to use the, to do optical phase lock loops, and it gives extreme precision. Um, if you're an experimentalist, you know that it's straightforward to uh, have very good linear polarization, yeah? um, because you just go to companies like Halle or whatever, and they sell you something at the level of 10 to the minus 7, and if you get well-selected components, even 10 to the minus 8 or so. Yeah? It's very difficult to go for good circular polarization. This device gives you better circular polarization than any optical component you can buy or so. And it's done the following way. We have just two waves, and we, we compose it very simply the way you would do it in, in, uh, in a textbook experiment. Yeah? You use linear polarization and the other linear polarization, then you just use a phase control to superpose them, and then you have the uh, circular polarization or the elliptic polarization or the linear polarization, whatever you like or so. Yeah. And so we have uh, some interesting detail actually. Uh, so you have to have find some way to superpose these two uh, polarizations. Uh, and the, a neat detail is we looked for quite some time for the, the, the right way to superpose them. And only the Wollaston prisma is going to give you the right thing because the Wollaston prisma um, has the special property that it does not dist distort the, the shapes, the geometric shapes of the two beams. All other polarizers distort slightly the shapes of the beams, and so then you have trouble, which is something you would have to correct again. Yeah? So it took us some time, but now we uh, can align these two lattices, and we can steer it across 100 sides in 20 microseconds or so, or 30 microseconds, uh, with a level of, at the level of 10 to the minus 5. This is sub-nanometer precision here, and with a huge bandwidth, with one megahertz bandwidth. Yeah? This is impossible with any of the other devices. So I think um, this is a very neat device. It's even, I think it's even interesting for telecommunication where we, we, you are able to generate single sideband uh, modulation uh, cases here. Yeah? So you, the usual modulation gives you two sidebands, but telecommunication would like to sell the other one to somebody else. So you want single sideband communication, uh, sideband modulation. Yeah? So it's even possible to, to, to use it along those lines. Okay, so this is the new device, and we are now using it. You see this is already 30, uh, 30 uh, sites or so. We, this is a fairly large uh, system in our old apparatus. And so in order to uh, sort these atoms into a nice array with exactly, in this case, 34 uh, separations in between, so we, have, we turn one atom around, then we bring it. With this, this is thrown out, and then we just uh, atom by atom bring them to where we want to have them. Yeah? And so then we have a perfectly sorted array of atoms, and we can actually do this all the way down to atoms in Im immediately adjacent states. And they are also now uh, cooled in the longitudinal directions at the level of 98% into the emotional ground state. In the transverse direction we have in this 1D apparatus still a bit of a uh, problem. We only get to something like 80% of the ground state, but it's good enough to do some of the uh, first experiments also. So we think that with these kinds of arrangements, and this should, be, this should straightforwardly scale up now to 10, 20 atoms perfectly arranged in a row, and then ready to do experiments exploiting their internal degree of freedom. So, um, for the new world, we have constructed what we call a quantum walk microscope. It really, this is, a, this is not an uh, artificial drawing. This is a picture of that. This is our new experimental cell. This is the microscope objective. And uh, we're very proud of this objective. Carsten Rohm's um, student in my group designed this objective with only two lenses. And, and it has fairly spectacular properties, a numerical aperture at a separation of 150 microns, which for all these experiments is a really very large distance or so. Um, is 0.92, and it's measured at this level, and uh, so the resolution is uh, 560 nanometer, we, which means we have single site resolution, and we have also single site uh, ca uh, addressing cap capability, and um, uh, for the experts, this is the Strel ratio, and the Strel ratio is a measure which tells you whether you are truly in the uh, diffraction limited uh, area or not, and so if it's bigger than 0.8, the saying is we are in the diffraction limited area indeed. It basically means you really collect all your, all your intensity at the point where you expect it to be, yeah? uh, physically speaking. And uh, so this is what it looks like. And by the way, the, one of the big, uh, technically one of the big things was to make this holder or so, uh, because you need to make a holder. We only could drop in the lenses and then it had to be perfect. And then this means you need to make a holder which is precise at the level of one micron or one and a half microns and this in some ceramics. And we found a company, it wasn't even too expensive. And what, what I find interesting, I mean, microscopy was known all the way back to the 17th century by Leuvenhoek or so in Holland. 
Um, but it only got really started when Abbe in the 19th century found out how to align uh, the, the microscope. This was the breakthrough for uh, going to microscopy. Okay, anyway, so this is a very neat device, and uh, we now also have our 2D lattice of atoms uh, working. So this is our lattice here. It, we have actually, it's uh, turned uh, upside down uh, in reality in order to not collect dust, even in vacuum. You find that sometimes something happens and you have a piece of dust, and that's better if you use it the right way around. So this is in the background a picture, a picture of the atoms, and uh, here you can see that we really, there's a, it's not yet perfectly aligned. Um, we think that we will have perfect distinction between two atoms uh, very soon also here. There's also a little bit of a halo still going on because we do not yet select the plane, but then we should have a rather perfect uh, system to uh, walk in, to work in two dimensions. Let me briefly go back to the 1D system. Uh, we also have interactions now in our system. So how would you, how would you work out interactions uh, or, or look for indistinguishability? Um, I, we said we want to look for indistinguishability in this first way, but we can also, uh, we have implemented a classic Hong or Mantle experiment. So we start with two atoms here, then we use a microwave to flip one atom over. This means we can use our transportation device to bring this atom exactly into the same site as this one. And so then they have two opposing spins and they are distinguishable, but then we rotate them into the equatorial plane. And this means we make them uh, uh, indistinguishable by uh, just applying the microwave rotation. And then after some time, which also induces, uh, which induces two things. It induces um, indistinguishability interference and at the same time it also has some uh, interaction because of some scattering length between the two atoms. And then we do an experiment. We bring one spin component here and the other one here. And then, then we measure do we have zero, one, two atoms or so. It's basically a parity measurement. And um, uh, we, I'm not, I don't even want you to, to, uh, to see what's really here. Um, there's, the analysis is not so completely trivial in this case because you have to infer this from the parity measurement. Uh, but our parity measurement tells us that, it, that the, the measurement that we have is at this moment consistent with 80% ground state occupation. And we are four sigma off in our signal from the signal that you would expect for distinguishable uh, atoms. We cannot do a simple experiment that you may be more used to in, micro, in Hong Kong Mandel experiments, seeing a dip in some uh, two atom experiment or so. Yeah? And so, but it also means that if you want boson sampling, or if you want to work with more atoms, this is a, a super uh, scaling object here uh, to go for this. We should be able to, as you saw from this uh, collective, for instance, we should take our four atoms and which we should be immediately, once the apparatus is back to work, uh, to do this also with four atoms, and uh, in a Hong Kong mantle experiment with four atoms or so. Okay, so this looks quite nice, and this is something I really like also. Uh, Carsten Ohms, by the end of his thesis in, in uh, 2016, last fall, came up with this idea, um, sorting atoms at the time scale. Of course, you would like to make, so we would use, like to use this method that I showed you that we have implemented with this um, uh, controlled motion device of the two lattices and uh, make even bigger arrays in the 2D lattice now. So we don't start with the BEC. We just start with a magneto-optical trap and then we throw the stuff into, the, um, into our lattice, we cool it down, and then we go on. And uh, then, of course, what we have is a random filling of this lattice at the level of 50%. There's a few methods where you can do better, but let's assume it's 50%. And then the question was, well, this, is a, this is approximately the size of our, of our system that we can work with. This is our field of view. And so the question is then, can we uh, fill this lattice? Um, and of course, at this point, we just had to do a simulation. And the idea is now the following. So we just look for an area with the, with the classical computer. It doesn't take too long. Is this well filled? Does it make sense to work here? And then we look within the other random things. Are there? areas where we find a good match to uh, use the f to, to fill up the other holes, yeah? And uh, if, you, if you find this one, for instance, you may have to throw out a few of these atoms, which, you can, which we can do by uh, uh, pushing them out. And then we just bring this area here, this area here, this area here. And uh, typically, in a small number of steps, we have almost perfectly filled arrays of atoms. And the great thing is it scales logarithmically only with a number of uh, atoms in here. And so I think even for, um, I think this is a bit exaggerated. So I think we have one second for 20 by 20 atoms or 25 by 25 atoms, not 100 by 100 atoms. But I think that's, uh, that's also maybe a neat project, uh, a neat uh, prospect because we, at the same time, we can cool to the 
ground state at the level of 97, 98% in here, in, in 3D. Okay, so uh, finally, another perspective, we want to apply artificial magnetic fields in our system. So because we have this very high numerical aperture object, what we can do, we can imprint phase shifts in a spatially varying way onto our atoms. Yeah? And um, there's a scheme in our case. We use cesium atoms. Cesium atoms, it turns out, are for these experiments very beneficial for many reasons. Um, and uh, what, so what, in order to implement an artificial field, you have to implement a spin-dependent phase shift. Yeah, that's, that's all in the end you have to do. And we do this by imprinting and we can do it in a spatially varying way. And um, so uh, what we have to do, we have to uh, make sure that uh, the pseudo spin stayed up and the pseudo spin stayed down, experience different, different level shifts. And this can be achieved by taking a wave which is tuned exactly to the uh, near resonant wave, which is tuned to the center of the fairly large hyperfine structure. This is the atomic clock transition in cesium. And uh, so then you achieve exactly this. You have a downward and an upward shift here uh, for a single system. And uh, then we can use atoms stepping around in our lattice. And we can also apply a gradient. This gradient corresponds then to a magnetic field, to so the uh, field. And one nice thing is also, uh, because everything is discrete, we can apply these phase shifts when the atom don't move at all at that moment, where they just sit at their positions. We apply the phase shifts, and then only in the next step, we let them move around to the next position and so on. So everything is really completely, I'm not sure it's co correct to call it digital, but it's stepwise and discrete uh, for sure. And then we should be, for instance, um, able to map out this um, uh, Hofstadter butterfly. This is calculated for the quantum walk situation gives the level density uh, for that. And we should also uh, use other fields. Yesterday there was, um, or, or in the past days, we had also talks about uh, topological systems. So one, one funny thing we should be able to do is we should be able to operate a magnetic field which is pointing up and then take, that's this shape here, we should be able to take this shape here and have it uh, point down in the magnetic field. So you have a transition across this edge from magnetic field pointing up to pointing down. You can probably not do this in nature, I don't know. Uh, but uh, just for fun, for the fun. And because of the resolution of our, uh, because of the resolution of our objective, the transition width in our experiment should be one or two lattice sites, not more. Uh, this is what we uh, need this for also. And then I can just show you what happens. So in this case, this is an initial uh, atom prepared in two different sites. Actually, this is the number of the positions here. And we can just watch uh, what the simulation tells us what's going to happen. And uh, then what you see is that um, the particle should nicely move around on this edge state, which is one of the predictions of the uh, Bayek edge correspondence in uh, topological states. So, so far, that's just, um, as I said, uh, simulations, but I think the apparatus should give us access to these kinds of experiments. Okay, um, what are the ultimate limits? So right now, I think we operate on time scales per operation at the level of 20 microseconds, and we can do something like 100 operations. I think implementing better magnetic shielding, uh, for instance, and we are going slightly down here, we would be able to do 1,000 operations. The ultimate limitation is about... Um, is the T1 time of our system. In the end, what we need to do for the spin-dependent transport, we need to use a magic wavelength, not going to in, to the detail, which needs to be tuned in the, in between the fine structures, and um, then that causes scattering, and this is uh, 100 milliseconds. This is where we will be limited to in this case here. Yeah? And uh, there is a way to overcome even this, and uh, this goes back to Andrea Alberti also. We don't have to use cesium. There's better atoms. You, have to, you want to turn this uh, structure uh, upside down, so have the fine structure in the ground state, and there is an atom of that kind, it's indium, then you would be able to go up to 10, 10 seconds. The splitting is much larger, so all the conditions for having a long T1 time are much better, and so we, if we achieve one microsecond or so, we should be able to do one million operations or so. When we started all this out, we were thinking of quantum cellular automata, and of course we forgot completely about this, but maybe in, in uh, 10 or 20 years, it may come up again uh, that we would be able to realize these kinds of uh, objects. Okay, I would like to say Andrea Alberti really is a very strong driving force in this field and uh, making a lot of uh, good progress in this experiment. Okay, let me uh, come to briefly to uh, another experiment which also connects with something we heard about here 
earlier, two atoms interacting with a cavity. Uh, this is our experiment, and uh, you may remember the uh, talk um, on the uh, uh, Dicke uh, phase transitions, the experiments by Tillmann Esslinger. We did related experiments with two atoms only. And so you have two atoms sitting in a cavity. They are excited from the side, and uh, they can have separations, and their separations determines of how they interact with the cavity field. And what we do is we observe the light emitted from the cavity. Yeah? And uh, so um, we can have especially a lambda pattern uh, where there's a relative phase shift zero, and you expect what is called the uh, super radiant or Dicke state radiance, or we can have a lambda over two pattern, which means the two antennas are out of phase, and this should be dark. The state should be dark. Yeah? And this is exactly what we see in the experiment. So here there is a trace of this experiment. Actually, the atoms are not perfectly localized in their sites, so they hop around. And this means that what they do is they hop around between a bright state, a super radiant state, and the dark state, which you see down below here. And in fact, we worked out with Klaus Mirmer uh, how you could associate whether they are at this point position or at this point with some hidden Markov model uh, analysis, which was even published with Klaus and his uh, colleague together. And so, uh, yes, we do see these two things. And uh, so we create a two-atom bright state and a dark state and a superradiant and a subradiant state, if you want so. Now, perhaps the more interesting point about all this is this trace here. This is a single trace. Here we have two atoms. You see the fluctuation going on again. And then we lose atom after atom from the cavity. Here's the first atom is lost. And then eventually it's no atom and no light. Yeah, that's trivial. The interesting point here is that the one atom level of fluorescence is no stronger than the two atom level of fluorescence. So there's nothing like super radiance in here. Super radiance would claim you have two antennas, you would expect fourfold of the intensity. Yeah? So the reason why that is not the case is that our cavity is almost perfect. And the back of action of the cavity is so strong that the cavity, um, so what happens is if you have a radiator, it radiates 90 degrees out of phase with the incoming light field. And then when it comes back, then again, the excited state is again 90 degrees out of phase. So the cavity acts in such a way that it always makes sure that only a certain degree of polarization is available, irrespectively whether you have one, two, or many atoms in your cavity at these uh, patterns. Yeah? So that's, I think, in, in fact, the more interesting effect. That the cavity completely suppresses any super radiance here. OK. Last part towards quantum technology. What does it take? Uh, yeah, what does it take to build a quantum repeater? A big jump for a moment. So we have Alice and Bob, and they want to communicate by quantum means. This is something we made from a public message. What's, what's the big difference between quantum and classic? Uh, the big difference is that classic uh, security relies on algorithmic schemes, whereas we want to rely on physical schemes. And the trouble is, we have we, you can buy point to point connections, but you cannot buy very long distance uh, connections. So what's the trouble? The trouble is shown in here. This is as a function of the um, separation of Alice and Bob, the level of attenuation if you send this on fibers. And this is for realistic things. Yeah? And so for point-to-point -point quantum link, so you lose. Uh, it's, the fibers are superb, but you still lose. And in contrast to uh, your classical thing, you cannot pump up. You cannot re-amplify your signal. Because losing quantum information losing means randomly losing the photons one by one. And only a few of the photons arrive in the end. Yeah? And so eventually you uh, end up in some noise. And eventually you also are limited by some minimum rate that you would like to have. And so um, what you, then you could think, OK, let's do this from two sides. And let's, from two sides, send these uh, photons in and somehow connect them at the center in a quantum way with a better measurement or so. But it turns out that it's, that's not really clever. So this would be now two strings, but the photons arrive randomly. <clears throat> and you still have to rely then on two photons arriving at the same time. And this means that the probability is uh, simply your length squared. And this is, of course, the same as twice uh, the length. So you haven't gained anything. Yeah? This is, by the way, called a quantum, re a quantum uh, relay. And so the quantum relay doesn't help you to overcome this, what is also called the TW, uh, TGW bound. So what can we do? We need to install quantum memories. Yeah, so what do quantum memories do? Instead of having these random arrivals, you keep one of the until the other random uh, probably has, in total, risen to almost one so that you can really do this. And this is the way to overcome this by uh, this uh, level by uh, quantum repeaters. And so if you have one stretch, which is this long, then you can put the second 
wherever with this memory and you don't lose anymore. Yeah? So your limit, you are fixed here. Now you can say, of course, I can also put this somewhere else. And then what really happens, the perfect quantum limiter brings you up into this. We call this now, it's not quantum supremacy, but it's repeater supremacy. And you can even do more than one node. And then already at short links, uh, you gain. Yeah? So there's, um, in my view, uh, to show, nobody has shown the quantum repeater principle yet, I think. So in order to show this, it's sufficient to do this at uh, short distances, not at long distances. Yeah? So you don't have to go to that uh, point. And uh, I think that's something we really would like to do in the future. And uh, so what in our group we are trying to do, we are trying to combine multi-atom uh, light matter enhancement and cavity enhancement. And uh, well, this is the schemes we use Fabi Perot resonators implemented with um, optical fibers. We are setting up a new lab. We welcome everybody to collaborate with us uh, on this. And uh, these give very nice pictures now on uh, strong coupling. I'll, I'll rush through this now. And uh, yeah, let, let's just forget about this, come to my last slide. Um, so on, on quantum technology, I think in our, in our romantic view, this is the way we uh, view ourselves. So philosophers of science are so with scientific questions, making continuous or sometimes also discontinuous process and so on. I think in, at least for the experimentalists in the real world, there's more things, we need funding, and there's even another thing, careers and so on. And so all this is mixed with each other. And so in the end, I think your Quest uh, Institute is uh, sitting at a point where these are not, no longer going exactly in parallel. Yeah? Some of this may go on because I think also because human uh, inertia keeps you going on the same trail. But there's other ways which I think have to go into quantum technology so engineers and engineering will play a bigger role. Uh, I, in my point, that's a very valuable and very good uh, evolution. And I would like to, to finish by wishing your uh, new institute here in this spirit uh, good success. And um, maybe two more uh, short slides or pictures. The laser is now in its 55th, 57th year. I should have renewed the slide. <laughs> um, and um, the taming of light. And I think what we do is really closely related to the taming of light. This is the, this is the economic growth in light-related methods. Yeah, you see it's ex still exponentially growing. This is 2015. It keeps growing. In Germany, we have growth rates in this industry at the level of 10 to 15 percent. I'm sure, I'm sure Israel is taking its share on that. And so um, it's in photonics. And I believe that photons and quanta are going to be part of our lives. And uh, thank you very much.